Hello, and welcome to a new Starting Conversation series. I'm Bethany Tabor from the New Mexico Humanities Council, and this series is History, Memory, and Public Space. In this first discussion, we'll be talking broadly about historical perspectives. We integrate local and professional voices to help define the study of history, its purpose, significance, circulation, and regionalism. The creation of the atomic bomb in Los Alamos that continues to affect the entire world provides us a rich case study for helping understand the timelines, relevance, and perspectives that shape the study of history. This series is facilitated by Rafi Iandonian. Rafi is a best-selling author of three books. He has previously worked guiding visitors at the Gettysburg battlefields, the Civil War sites around Richmond, the Martin Luther King birth home in Atlanta, and the History Museum in Los Alamos, New Mexico. He has a master's degree in history and another master's degree in historic preservation. Rafi is joined today by two guests, Christian Fuhrer and Dr. John Bartlett. Christian Fuhrer is a senior historian for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Prior to his current appointment, he served as a senior historian at US Special Operations Command, deploying to Afghanistan on three occasions to serve on the headquarters staffs of elite special operations forces. He previously worked for the National Park Service at historic sites in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Alaska. He is a distinguished graduate from the US Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and studied history at West Virginia University. He lives in Northern Virginia. The thoughts, views, and opinions expressed by Mr. Fuhrer are entirely his own and do not represent those of the Department of Defense. Dr. John Bartlett had a distinguished 31-year career at Los Alamos National Laboratory as a research chemical engineer. His professional work applied methods in his field, from process design and unit operations to the control of integrated systems and extending to safety concerns and economics. At Los Alamos National Labs, Bartlett was a co-leader of a facility for developing and testing integrated systems for reprocessing tritium, a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. The project was jointly funded by the US Department of Energy and by the Japan Atomic Energy Research Institute and staffed by scientists and engineers from Los Alamos and from Japan. Dr. Bartlett has had a concurrent career as a volunteer since the formative years of the environmental movement, from which he writes a monthly newspaper column on broad aspects of the environment and the role of the public forum. So without further ado, Rafi, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Bethany, and thank you to the New Mexico Humanities Council. Um, and so this is part of a three-part series. Um, as you know, we're going to have three parts for history, memory, and public sites. And this here is going to be our first episode, our first part focusing on history. And uh, we're looking at history here as it, as it um, pertains to historic sites. Um, if we think about the larger series that's about history, memory, and public sites, um, when we focus here on the first of the three-part series, we are focusing on the study of history and the subject of history, but really we're considering it within the context of historic sites. Now, it's important to distinguish historic sites and monuments. The way I think of historic sites are the site where an event actually took place, whereas monuments are often commemorative and they're depictions or representations of someone or something or some sort of concept or event or person that may or may not be on the actual site. Um, so for example, from my perspective and from my experience, you have Gettysburg where the actual battle took place, but you may also have monuments um, uh, such as the Oñate Monument in New Mexico in Albuquerque that is not necessarily a site connected to Oñate, but a historic site in New Mexico might be the Trinity site where the bomb was actually tested. Now, at times you may have a monument on top of a site. We're not gonna get into that layer of complication today, but historic sites and history as it pertains to us is the tangible place, the tangible link to the past where you get that sense of place where the event actually happened. And so to talk about the broader concept of history and sites here today is of course, John Bartlett and Christian Fuhrer, the two panelists. The way I designed this panel was for Christian as a professional historian to provide us the global perspective on the study of the history, study of the past, and John to provide us a local perspective from New Mexico in the community of Los Alamos, where he has had many involvements in history in the community. So thank you gentlemen for joining me. 
Thank you. So I want to start off today with our first large question, which is, what is history? How do we define it? Christian, why don't you get started since you're the professional historian? Okay, well, thank you, Rafi, and to the Humanities Council for, uh, for hosting not just this event and this conversation, which as a historian, I am biased to see its value and worth, but uh, these kind of conversations generally. Um, I, just, I think they're very important for us to just take a moment, sit, and uh, to ponder on. So what is history? Um, in the most general sense, uh, history is the study of the past. Um, sometimes you will hear it referred to simply as, that's history, or that's ancient history, when having a conversation and such. In, in that casual sense, it, we're defaulting as the past, but in a, in a scholarly sense, and for our purposes, when we talk about history, we're talking about history as a study um, and history as a form of investigation, where you uh, call through uh, primary source material um, and uh, create a, an argument uh, and present that argument and advance that knowledge and understanding of a historic event. And, and history begins from the moment something occurs um, until this present hour. Uh, so the history of something that happened, say, as you referenced the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, begins as just as the guns fall silent, and it's something that is still discussed and debated uh, among academics and the public at large uh, to this very moment. John? Uh, from a local perspective, uh, I've observed some very interesting dynamics, uh, local perspective in Los Alamos. Uh, you talk about how uh, there's the original history that takes place, and then immediately there begins a discussion of it and adding to it or subtracting from it, as the case may be. A very good example of that is uh, in the Los Alamos National Laboratory Bradbury Science Museum, which is in downtown Los Alamos. It's a science museum about what the laboratory does. But in a corner of that museum is a thing called the Forum Wall, which began in about 1995 when uh, critics of nuclear bombs and bombing of Japan during the war wanted some space to tell their view of the bombing uh, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, that went up uh, on the wall and there was a there was a, a comment book actually, and this is a central feature of this. A comment book was on a stand, online com, uh, comment book inviting people watching the exhibit to give their comments. And there were comments of all kinds, thoughtful comments, religious comments, uh, vulgar comments, abusive comments, uh, artwork was put on that and all. Not, not too long, the laboratory scientists and veterans of the Second World War, which included the VFW, American Legion, the Navajo Code Talker Association, obviously have a stake in the communications about uh, the war in the Pacific, where they were. And they wanted some space to tell their side of the story. And so uh, there was a lot of hoorah, as there always is, and newspaper articles and complaints, but eventually the space was split. And there is to this day still, the stand with the comment book, half of the wall space is taken up by the anti-nuclear exhibits, showing bombed out cities and what's giving their side of that. And the other half is by this joint group. And the comment book is fascinating because, and in a way, the comment book may not be where the bombs were dropped, but it is a real live action site of the dialogue, if you will. And the fact that it is a comment book that's open-ended, it doesn't say, write your comment on this slip of paper and put it in the box. Since it's all together, people read all the comments comment on the comments, draw arrows to another comment and say, this guy is a great guy or this guy is all wet. And you build up, have built up since 1995, 
uh, these these comments. My wife wrote a, a master thesis at UNM on those comments. There's, and the part of the story is that all of those comments together, being there, really allows people to hear the story in a way that's different when somebody is giving a, a speech on it. There's a John. comment in there. There's a comment in there by a veteran who says, I disagree with what the anti-nuclear people say, but that's what I fought for, their right to say it. And that says a lot. There's one little comment in there, it's five words long. To me, it's so short and punchy that it's the grit of what we're talking about here. The entire comment says, it was neat and sad. That's the whole story. People say, half the people say it's neat, the other half say it's sad, and they'll go to their desk uh, arguing that out. It was neat and sad. And that was written by a man named GD from NH. I suppose that's from Hampshire. There's comments in there from all over the world. So John, I think that what you said there kind of allows me to kind of dive a little deeper in this question about what is history and how we define it is sort of why does it matter? Because I think Christian, I want to come back to you here for a moment because you know what John's talking about with the comment book there to me is a great example of you know, seeing why history matters to people, at least in that regard, in that context. And can you kind of, as a professional historian, kind of, you know, someone that's done a lot of history in the past and, and present and professionally trained, elaborate on how you see that and how you see history as, as mattering? Why does it matter to study it? I think that, you know, something that's poignant is what John was talking about is that as we study the past, there are certain things that we can establish as facts. We can establish the date in which, say, the atomic bomb was first tested. We can establish the date in which the atomic bomb was first used. We can establish the date it was used a second time. But when we stop and we step back and we look, we are naturally inclined to ask other questions. And those are the questions that begin to go to the, so what? and that we begin to seek meaning, not just that this happened, but what does this mean? How were decisions made? And as we begin to ask those questions that go beyond the, the basic most fact, that's where we now begin to get into divergent perspectives. When we get into divergent arguments, as we begin to sort our way through through a particular issue. And then that gets into an issue I'm sure you'll discuss in other settings where we then have an issue of history and then we have an issue of memory. And sometimes the way in which events are remembered publicly or individually and the way in which they actually occur can be two very, very different things. But I think when you find that someone is going to go and take and, and in essence apply their personal perspective and opinion and reflection on to a historical moment in a historical place, such as John was discussing. You're taking a, a personal perspective, a form of a historical argument, some more thoughtful and informed than others, and you contribute it. So there is a, there's a history of the entire uh, development of an atomic weapon, and then there is an entire history of the perception and the feeling of those very tools. You know, I think if we pause just for one more uh, second to linger on the fact that everything has a history. The development of the atomic bomb has, has a scientific history. Its use has a history in military history. Its implications affect social and cultural history. And it also then has a, a, has a history and is a point of departure that frames everything that follows it. Um, and as we, as we move through the Cold War, it affects the way we see the very world in which we live. In the post-Cold War, it acts as a benchmark. All points of departure and all a common point of return. Uh, John, what do you think as far as why history matters? And, and you, with your involvement in the community in Los Alamos and New Mexico generally, um, in addition, what do you think the purpose of history is from your perspective as someone that's a you know, an educated, non-professional historian, what do you see as the purpose as well? 
well, um, what, what Christian says is all so, and I wouldn't uh, disagree with it. Uh, it's also a personal, people, no matter what the history is, people will have personal differing views of it. That's the nature of human beings uh, in, in essence. Uh, Christian had commented on a big thing that always comes up is why was the bomb dropped? And maybe a purpose of history is to answer that question. Uh, a very, uh, the history of why was the bomb dropped is evolving, uh, has evolved for all the years since since it was dropped. Um, in 19, the bomb was dropped in 1945. And the second bomb was dropped in 1945. And the Russians invaded Manchuria in 1945. In 1965, the Japanese uh, put together a team of journalists and writers to find out why, why, what was the story of the Japanese surrender? Because the story of the Japanese surrender is integrally in, involved in why was the bomb dropped? You know, obviously if the Japanese had surrendered six months earlier, there'd be no drum bomb. If the Japanese didn't surrender six months later, there'd be a, a story would be very different. There'd be probably more bombs and there'd be more invasion. But the Japanese, they didn't know why the Japanese surrendered or didn't surrender when they surrendered in August of 1945, because that was, that was going on at the time. And these writers talked to the people on the Japanese War Council who made that decision. They made that decision after the first bomb was dropped, after the second bomb was dropped, after the Russians had invaded Manchuria, and they're still debating amongst themselves uh, what Japan should do. And they're not really wrestling with the atomic bomb or anything of that sort. They're wrestling with their own history. What does it mean to Japan to surrender? What does it mean to Japan's future if they surrender? What does it mean to Japan's future if they don't surrender? Uh, there's all those questions about what is the meaning of, of history as well. That book uh, is available on Amazon. It's called Japan's Longest Day. It's called Japan's Longest Day because it's the story mostly of the last day before the Japanese surrender. Uh, and a movie is made in Japan by Japanese, Japanese actors, Japanese direction, uh, Jap famous Japanese actors uh, in, in 2015 called The Emperor in August. And that is the story of Japan's longest day told in movie form. So it's very compact. You're telling the history of a nation almost in a two hour movie. If that's not compact, I don't know what is. So that's a different answer perhaps, but it is still part of the answer. Other movies may be made, the movies have been made before uh, on all sides. Um, another aspect that one could add to that, there is now growing the potential in museums for one museum to show what's going on in another museum. So you could show the Peace Museum in Hiroshima in the Los Alamos Historical <laughs> Museum and vice versa. I think what you're starting to do there as far as building joint history and uh, coordinating it or uncoordinating it as the case may be. So John, I think one of the things that you're pointing to that I think is very um, valuable is, you know, maybe one of the, one, maybe one of the reason that history matters is that it helps shape our perceptions of ourselves in the present and how we relate also to other societies, right, around if it's a local community around the country or around the world, you know, depending on exactly what you're looking at. And, and I think Christian, you know, some of the stuff you said about, you know, the, the meaning that we're trying to extrapolate from history while studying it is really valuable to helping us understand the purpose because the, the purpose really to me, based on hearing you guys is to also understand that there are different perspectives, different layers, 
and also to help us question the present, right? And so by learning more about how and why the world around us came to be, we understand more about the context and the situation around us. And so with that kind of perspective in mind, I wanna kind of shift to our next major topic, which is comparing local and global perspectives. Um, you know, how would you compare local perspectives and global perspectives? I mean, we can do that in general, of course, and in particular, you know, um, for example, John, especially with the atomic bomb, you know, you're already touching on that a little bit with some of your stories, John, and, and you know, the, the atomic bomb is a great case study for helping us understand the value of local and global perspectives. So um, how would you compare the two? Christian, let me start with you. Comparing local and global, I mean, they, they are two, they are two ends of the, of the, of the same, um, of the same question. Uh, they're just a degree of scope and scale. Um, as you look at something that is local or you take the local perspective, you're obviously taking a smaller scale to understand how something much larger than that community affected it. Um, vice versa, the things that happened in the little community of Los Alamos, New Mexico in the 1940s would have dramatic repercussions, not just in Japan, uh, but defining an entire era afterwards. Um, you know, a legacy that we still live with today. But even outside those communities, the story of what happened there and in Japan um, is a story that can be told and examined in any and every community um, that, say, sent soldiers to, to fight in the Pacific. Um, or from elsewhere around the world who are in that theater. Um, it's, it's more of how, on a global perspective, events that are unfolding, how they are experienced in everyday communities at a local level. And then again, to have those moments where something profound happens in a community that can move not just na a nation, but move nations. Um, so uh, if, that, if that answers your, your question, I have yes, a absolutely. little mini story here that I think will fit yeah, in. Go ahead, John. This is the miniest of mini stories. Uh, and you'll see the connection between the smallest local perspective and the world perspective. As I said in your, uh, my resume, I was a, a co-leader of a project at Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, in the 1980s. That was 40 years, 35, 40 years after the war. We had Japanese scientists and engineers on the project. Four of them came to town with their families. They, uh, they worked with us. We were co-responsible for the facilities and its operation. The Hiro, uh, Emperor Hirohito, whom I mentioned, was the emperor, that was the emperor in August, who was there the day the decision was made to, uh, in the place when the whether Japan should surrender. He died in 1989 in the midst of our project with the Japanese in Los Alamos. Japanese were on site. We were there uh, as a co-leader. I went to the uh, head of the Japanese delegation on site and said, what should we do as a project to, on this occasion of the emperor dying? Uh, we're a joint project. We had done things together of that sort. What would be an appropriate action or response or statement at this time in this place from this project? And I was somewhat surprised by the Japanese response. It was nothing, absolutely nothing. Emperor is not important. Uh, it is important to the older generation. Most of these scientists and engineers were either not born or were too young to be very uh, cognizant during the war. What the emperor had been to Japan, they never knew. And they said nothing. It would be appropriate to do nothing. The older generation, fine. But with our project, we should do nothing. What does that say? It says, how did the role of the empire change? The uh, role of the emperor changed between 45 and, and I think there's a lot in that tiny story. There's a lot about the world, the changes in Japan, the changes in the US. So 
John, let me stay with you for just one moment to dig a little deeper there. And you're giving us that perspective. How do you see the local and global perspectives informing each other? Um, I know you've dealt with not only that story, but you know, a lot of involvement in Los Alamos and history, and, and as you've already been talking about um, with Japan and the US, and how do you see those two informing each other in our understanding and studies? Well, I, I always start out because of who I am. I'm not an historian, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I start out with the local, what I see locally. I saw Four Wall locally, I saw a Japanese movie locally. <laughs> I talked to the Japanese contingent locally. And from that, I, I tell you, I see the things that I've told you here. Look what we've learned about, made us, we haven't learned how things have changed in Japan, but we were told personally by those people without them even knowing it. Uh, uh, how, does it how does it evolve? I don't think there's, a sharp answer to your question. It is it always evolves. It should evolve. Pay attention to to all the factors, the local and the global, as it evolves. That's how you learn the most there is to know about it. Um, don't believe any single comment in the comment book by itself. Believe all of the comments in the comment book put together. And as I said, those are from all over the world. Um, those are little pieces of, of what I see. I can even see that all of this that what we're talking about now could lead to the point where I, I sometimes talk about the Vietnam Wall, which solved the problem of the how should the US think about the troops in the Vietnam era. They were, they were abused when they first came back. Vietnam Wall comes up. The wall says, heroes fight in wars. Heroes are killed in wars. Non-heroes are killed in wars. Victims are killed in wars. It told two sides of the story. Uh, the tragedy of war and the heroism in war. And that's in a sense, the story of the bomb also. The bomb was built by heroes that helped to end the war successfully. And it's a tragedy <laughs> what happened from it and, and if it were to happen again. So those are important and I can imagine exists and I can see companies that have become formed to make that kind of story of history and memorial instead of the general with the sword on the soldier on the horse only. Right. Yeah, thank you for that insight. And, and I love your community perspective and your many experiences that you bring here to the conversation. Now, Christian, let me go one more layer deeper on that question here with the international and local and ask you, kind of again, with your you know, professional training and expertise, how do you see the circulation of those different stories and circulation of history shaping perspectives? You know, those, those different layers that are there, how do you see those, that circulation, how history circulates, helping shape those perspectives? It's, it's not just how history circulates, it's how history develops. And that we need to understand that history is, is fundamentally a conversation, usually in the form of a polite argument um, that sometimes becomes a little impolite, depending on the passions involved. <laughs> but what you're doing is, as each generation, as you move from in proximity away from the historical event, and as each generation of scholars or whomever begin to ask questions of that event, the nature of the answer is going to begin to evolve over time. And this touches a bit on the notion of revisionism. And when we talk about revisionist history, there are two varieties. There is a legitimate variety of revisionist history, which represents that natural process as our understanding of a historical event evolves over time. And then you do have revisionist history um, where whoever it is that is doing the work of history, history, um, 
sort of abandons the standard of objectivity and begins to write toward a particular end. And that's not the sort of history I'm talking about here when I talk about revisionist history. And, and a useful analogy for understanding how that evolves, and it's imperfect, like all analogies are, but I want you to imagine that you find out after this uh, is over, after we are done recording today, that you have some sort of cardiac incident and you are being rushed to the hospital and you're gonna have to see a cardiologist and perhaps a heart surgeon to fix whatever it is that ails you. You're going to want your doctors um, to have the equivalent of revisionist medicine. You want them to be as well-read and as well-versed on the latest we know about the human heart. Now, when you think about it, the human heart, I am no doctor, but the human heart has not changed in tens of thousands, millions of years. But our understanding of the human heart and how the human heart functions and its purpose and its parts, and we, we arrive at that by asking different questions, studying it in different ways, applying different techniques, learning over time, having conversations among experts, and then our understanding of that advances. And we have to assume that though we think we know so much now, we know nothing compared to what the next generation of cardiologists will know. It's the same thing when it comes to history. We know far more only because of our distance that we can appreciate something in its totality, say the dropping of the atomic bomb. Our, our, our perspective has evolved. We have asked different questions. We have applied different techniques. We've added different layers to that story. We've rolled in memory because of time since has afforded us a place for memory. And, and, and now we have a different perspective than they did at that time. Does it mean that that was erroneous and wrong and short-sighted it's just the time, the perspective, and that layering of historical dialogue and conversation gives us. So Christian, let me follow up on that with a question. Um, John, go ahead. If you have a quick response, go ahead. I, I was going to say, there's also, there's always the ironies, ironies of history. The, uh, the conversation, the, the, the Japan coming to Los Alamos to work on Tritium together with, with us is an irony of history. I view that. Another irony of history is in Fredericksburg, Texas, which is the hometown of Admiral Nimitz, the Admiral in Chief in the War in the Pacific, is a Japanese garden built by the Japanese, designed by the Japanese, paid for by the Japanese, brought from Japan to Fredericksburg, Texas to install. Why was it brought there? Because they learned after the war that Nimitz, was a great fan of Admiral Tojo of Japan. Admiral Tojo was not in the Second World War. He came before that, but he developed the modern Japanese Navy. And Nimitz was a great admirer of Tojo. And he encouraged the Japanese people to build a monument to restore Admiral Tojo's warship. How's that for a monument? To honor this man who meant so much to the modern Japanese Navy. In return or in response, or because they felt like it, I don't know why. They built this Japanese garden with a model of Admiral Tojo's little house where he, little um, Japanese house where he did writing and so forth, is in the garden. And they're just there side by side. The War Museum of Admiral Nimitz tells all of the usual stories, bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and, and the garden is there. That's an irony and it's local, and it's international. Thank you, John. And so Christian, let me follow up on, you mentioned something about distance. You mentioned the importance of distance in helping us study history. So my question to you to build on that is, when do we have enough of a historical lens to give us a historical perspective? What's, the, what's that timeline you see, or what needs to happen or develop? It, it all depends on, on the circumstances of the moment or the event. Um, I think that when we, there are times in which things that are historic 
we only appreciate in hindsight, that they're in and amongst the mundane routines of life. Um, it's not the, the literal bang of a bomb that goes off to say, this is something different. And sometimes when we look back, we can say, you know, there was something going on over here on the fringe that ends up being a matter of consequence. There's also the moments um, that punctuate periods of time that stand out as clearly being different, arguably historic, but we don't know exactly what they mean. Um, for example, and they also, by the way, they bookend time. They, they serve as, as dividers because they mark a, a transition. When you had the firing of the guns from Charleston into Fort Sumter, that begins something the nation had never seen before, Civil War. It also punctuates a period and creates one that had never existed. It is only when those guns fire that now we can speak of an antebellum period. When we talk about the dropping of the bomb, now we have the atomic age. Then we have the rise of the Cold War. And then if we think in more recent memory, to now going on 21 years ago, the shared experience of September 11th. What that did as a nation for the world, but it punctuated a period that now we live in this ambiguous post 9-11 era. Now what's a historical event in recent memory that we know is significant, we aren't quite sure how, and we don't know what it represents in its entirety, and we won't, not in our lifetimes, and that is what occurred here in Washington on the 6th of January in the storming of the Capitol. Now, that event and all of its myriad and constituent parts, they all have a history. Now, what does that event mean as far as its history going forward? We don't know. We know it's different because it caught our attention and the attention of the world. It deviated significantly from the norm. Um, it was an attack not only on the, the building of the capital, but the institutions of government. It challenged our traditions. But as an event in a moment with the people who participated, given the context around the election, questions that historians can't answer yet is, does it represent the beginning of something big? Does it represent the end of something desperate? Is it the middle of something we can't appreciate until we have more time and can look back? Or in the larger scheme of things, will we look back in 10, 20, 50, 100 years and see it more as an asterisk rather than a great historical moment? And that is something that only time and scholarship and perspective and questions of people who will be around asking them and answering them long after us um, have their opportunity. And I think, Christian, that speaks to the dynamic. That, uh, John, one moment, I'll come right back to you, but I want to just add to Christian that, you know, um, that speaks to the dynamic of the fact that, um, well, history is dynamic. I mean, that speaks to the history of being dynamic, which you're describing, Christian, because the study and the, and the understanding of it can evolve over time, which also connects to your point on revisionist history, right? It's always changing. The study is always changing. And sometimes you don't always know in the moment, or you may not have enough lens yet to know. And that speaks to how those, you know, considerations are all related, whether it's the lens or the revisionism. Those are all related questions. Uh, John, what's your perspective on this? I know, you know, um, uh, you've been, uh, uh, you've kind of played a role in, in the atomic age, for example, as, as Christian described. So, um, or really in the Cold War, I should say, Cold War era. So post, post the post-war, um, post-World War II. So what's your perspective on that as to what lens we have to have for something to be historical? Well, the, the comment, uh, Christian raised the issue of the October 6, uh, January 6 incident. Think how unusual that is in history. There is a large event of historical something that's televised as it's going on and every level, it's on social media. People are being arrested because they were there and will go to jail because they showed a selfie of themselves doing the crime and they publish it on the internet. Uh, talk about local and uh, the mixing 
between local and world perspectives, January 6th says they're becoming almost identical uh, in the digital age with the technologies that we have and the 24 seven covering of, of stuff. How, I hadn't ever thought about that, how strange that is that people are gonna be found guilty of crimes because they showed themselves performing the crime uh, on national TV and showed a selfie on the internet. Uh, is that good or bad for history? It's certainly getting closer to understanding it sooner than we would if we just wait for word of mouth to, to pass. It changes the, does it change the time scale in which it takes us to get from an event to understanding it more thoroughly from, from a hundred years to five years? I ask that question. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. We'll, I mean, I, we'll I think- find out. As Kristen says, we'll find out. Go ahead, Christian. What do you think? <laughs> I think one of the challenges of, of this particular time period when it comes to historical events goes to something John was talking about, and it is the proliferation of information. Mm -hmm. And as a historian, you would sit back and think, oh my goodness. I mean, I have records of everything. I, I have in the case of, let's say, the 6th of January, as a historian imagining looking backwards from the future back, I, I'm going to have videos. I'm going to have people recording their perspectives live. I'm going to have court testimony. I'm going to have government reports. I'm going to have all of this data and all of these people participating, leaving their remark. And, and that can help, but it makes it very difficult to sort through and trying to arrive at a coherent narrative, um, and especially of an issue that is politically charged, to be able to then formulate and present an argument based on the evidence. A, a prolific amount of evidence provides for a prolific amount of, of argument and interpretation. Uh, Christian, what I would add to that is, is that, you know, part of what allows and, and to help answer John's question to some level, uh, the beginnings of an answer is that part of the reason, part, while the information may influence kind of our sense of history, like you're describing, it may also, part of what changes history and the study of it is the, are the questions we ask. And the questions are so important. And, and regardless of how much information is available, the questions we ask will change over time. And therefore, the history will change. And so I'm going to wrap up with this last question for each of us just to give a one sentence answer to of what we think it means to think historically for the audience. For me, thinking historically means to ask questions. Christian, what does it mean to you? I, I would agree that, you know, fundamentally to think historically, you have to, to think with purpose and, and to engage with a genuine intellectual curiosity. Uh, Jill Lepore, a professor at Harvard and staff writer at The New Yorker, uh, in a book of hers, had, had written you know, that the past is an inheritance, a gift, and a burden. Can't be shirked. You carry it everywhere. There's nothing for it but to get to know it. And it's that process of getting to know it is how you begin to think historically. John, what does think historically mean to you? Historical perspective itself, which means being aware of history and historical perspective, is almost necessary to carry out history, uh, to, to further, you know, that we're in the middle now of a thing where the Was George Washington and Thomas Jefferson had slaves, so could they form a more perfect union. Um, and we're arguing amongst ourselves. Uh, well, they did a pretty good job in some ways, or, but we shouldn't disqualify the whole thing because it had that flaw in it, admitted flaw. Maybe those are just questions, which is what you said. Right. Uh, Maybe think historically for you means to think with some layer of complexity, it sounds like. Yes, yes. And maybe, maybe I think that way in part because you get so little of that on TV. And Christian, I think you want to add one more comment and then we're going to wrap up. 
as we think about studying the past and studying history, and we think about studying history seriously, I would just say that as much fun as it can be to, to go back and experience the past by trying to imagine and, and to explore and to find um, just a, a hobby interest in it, be mindful that if you are doing history and you only feel good when you're doing it, you're probably not doing history. <laughs> Doesn't mean you have to feel bad all the time, but history is not there to make us feel great. History doesn't care about those sort of feelings. I think that's a great concluding thought to segue to our next episode that's gonna come up on memory because history and memory, you touched on it, Christian, earlier, and um, you know how we exercise memory using history. So for the second episode, we will focus with a different panel on the topic of memory, meaning how we remember history. Bethany, I'll give it to you for the conclusion. Thank you, all of you. Um, <clears throat> that was such an insightful conversation and I really appreciate uh, your generosity in sharing all of your perspectives um, and your anecdotes, your stories. Um, I think it was really great. I One sort of observation that was running through my mind um, as you were talking is sort of the the, history is so uh, tangible in our everyday lives. I think that people don't always operate with that awareness that the fabric of our everyday is only is only here because of his, the historical events that have led up to that. And I think that that should conjure in us I know a sort of self-awareness or, or a self-consciousness about our actions now um, and what we are doing now is inevitably affecting the future. <clears throat> and that has implications, environmental implications, political, social, um, even art. I am trained as an art historian, so I have to put my plug in for <laughs> the visual art history. But um, I think that that is such a, uh, an important takeaway for me, and I hope for everybody watching, um, that everything, history is not just existing in the past. History has affected what we are doing now and what we're doing now will affect the future. So um, I just thank you for teasing out all of these nuances. And uh, in the description of this video, there are some links to um, some of the things that John Bartlett mentioned um, and referenced and more resources, more information if you want to explore more. And uh, once again, thank you, Rafi, John, and Christian, and tune in next time.